We are so grateful to have here today one of the foremost scholars and activists in the reparations movement in America, uh, Nikishi Taifa. Ms. Taifa is a human rights attorney, longstanding activist, author, and motivational speaker. She currently serves as advocacy director for criminal justice for the Open Society Foundations and Open Society Policy Center. Focusing on issues of sentencing reform, reform law enforcement reform, reentry, executive clemency, and racial justice. She also convenes the Justice Roundtable, a broad network of advocacy groups advancing federal criminal justice policy in Washington. The words that Ms. Taifa will share with us here today are entirely her own perspective, shaped by her career that spans over 30 years. Ms. Taifa has a rich history specializing in the advancement of issues and projects which enrich the legal, educational, cultural, and financial health of the community. She served as the founding director of the award-winning uh, Equal Justice Program at Howard University School of Law and as a legislative counsel for the American Civil Liberties Union from 1991 to 1994 where she was the principal spokesperson on criminal justice and civil rights issues. She was also the policy counsel for the Women's Legal Defense Fund from 1989 to 1991, staff attorney for the National Prison Project from 1984 uh, to 1987, and office manager and network organizer for the Washington office on Africa from 1980 to 1983. As convener of the Justice Roundtable, Ms. Taifa was in the leadership of the coalition responsible for the passage of both the Second Chance Act reentry legislation, um, which was passed in 2008, and the Fair Sentencing Act crack disparity legislation from 2010, and a major contributor to the Obama administration's historic clemency initiative, which took place between 2015 to 2016. Ms. Taifa currently serves on the legal advisory team of the legacy of the GU272 Alliance, which you all heard about earlier today. She's also past president of the DC chapter of the National Conference of Black Lawyer, Lawyers and founding member and form, former co-chair of the Legislative Commission of the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America. She is a commissioner on the National African American Reparations Commission and an advisor to the Institute of the B Black World 21st Century. Her work to further the cause of reparations for black Americans and her struggle to fight for justice and advance the civil rights movement is truly an inspiration to all of us. And we are so delighted to have and welcome Ms. Taifa here today to lay out the legal framework for the black American claim for reparations. So let's please allow them to My goodness gracious, I really, really would like to thank the University of Pennsylvania Law School and its fair symposium, Dean Ruger, uh, the Toll Public Interest Scholars, Chabelle Castro for introducing me, all of the great panelists that came before me and the insightful um, overview by Professor Dorothy uh, Roberts. This has indeed been an auspicious symposium, hasn't it folks? <laughs> I've been working actively on this issue of reparations for African Americans since 1975 at a time when the topic was not popular, when it was definitely on the fringes, when it was not fashionable to address the issue, when one would be branded as a militant or a revolutionary or just plain crazy, or I guess today branded as a black identity extremist. <laughs> So it gives me much pleasure today to now be in the company of some of the leading minds in the country, particularly from the academic community and across the diaspora, promoting the right to and the need for reparatory justice. Thank you, Penn Law, for your courage in putting on your website in big, bold letters, reparations now. And I say courage because we are in an environment today 
We no longer are abuses to be swept under the rug. We are in an environment today where top leaders feel constrained to assert, I am not a racist. We are in an environment today that demands justice and justice now, but we have not always been in such an environment. Indeed, the issue of reparations for African Americans was once in the not too distant past unthinkable by mainstream America as viable public policy. Much of the information about the enslavement era and the role of culpable partners has been buried for a very long time, but our history must not be buried. It must be brought out into the open. And this reminds me of the words of Mamie Till Mobley, the mother of 14-year-old Emmett Till, who in 1954 was abducted by whites from bed in his great uncle's house, thrown into Mississippi's Tallahatchie River. The only way her sons, horribly battered and disfigured body, beaten could be identified was by a ring that he wore on his finger. You see, Mamie Till refused a closed casket for her son. She said, I don't want to bury his memory under the rug. She stated emphatically, I want to open up the casket. Open it up, she said. I want the world to see what they did to my boy. And just as that casket was open for the world to see what was done to Emmett Till, today we are going to open up the casket of the legacy of enslavement, and we're going to talk about remedy. And so I am thrilled that the University of Pennsylvania Law School had the courage to host this convening, knowing quite well, as Brother Ari pointed out earlier, that it just may result in the opening up of bodies that undoubtedly lie in its own casket. And I submit that other academic institutions and religious institutions and corporations and the federal government need to follow suit. So I'm here to discuss the black American claim. And I smiled when I saw the subject because there's not just one black American claim, at least not yet. You see, just what the black American claim or whatever our term of usage is, African-American, New African, whatever. But that's part of the process. It's not like, Vereen, we're part of the CARICOM nations where we have a state government to speak for us as a whole. That really was, brother, a really part of the plan when I was first introduced to this issue of reparations back in 1975, that the subjugated government of the provisional government of the Republic of New Africa would sit down at the negotiating table with the government of the United States of America after the end of the war, okay, and make a reparations settlement. And that sounded great in theory, um, but it was far away from reality at that time. So the black American claim. Let me begin by stating emphatically that the concept of reparations for black people in America is not novel, nor is the demand for such compensation new. And that gets us out of um, Professor Carlton Waterhouse, that legal doctrine of latches that uh, he spoke of earlier, that uh, if you sleep on your claim, if you slumber, you know, you lose out, okay? The demand for reparations for the enslavement era and beyond has been continuous. And there has been no substantial period of time where the call for redress has been neglected. During the 19th century, the National Ex-Slave Mutual Relief Bounty and Pension Association, led by Reverend Isaiah Dickinson and Callie House, had 600,000 dues playing members seeking to obtain compensation for slavery from federal agencies. During the 1920s, the Honorable Marcus Garvey and the Universal Negro Improvement Association galvanized hundreds of thousands of black people demanding reparations and repatriation. In the early 1960s, Queen Mother Moore of New York presented a petition for reparations to the United Nations on behalf of her Ethiopian Women's Association. And during that same period in 1963, in his book, Why We Can't Wait, yes! Dr. Martin Luther King, yes indeed, proposed a Bill of Rights for the Disadvantaged, which emphasized redress for the historical victimization and exploitation of blacks, as well as their present day uh, uh, degradation. And I accidentally left my water over there in front of you. <laughs> in 1968, thank you so much. 
I'm going to need it because I... <laughs> In 1968, the Black Panther Party listed the issue of reparations and restitution for slave labor as point number three of their 10-point program. Also in 1968, the Republic of New Africa proclaimed in its Declaration of Independence, we claim no rights from the United States of America other than those rights belonging to our oppressed people, wherever they be in the world, and these include the right to damages, reparations due us for the grievous injuries sustained by ourselves and our ancestors by reason of U.S. lawlessness. In April 1969, the Black Manifesto was adopted by the National Black Economic Development Conference. This manifesto, presented by civil rights activist James Foreman, included a demand that white churches and synagogues pay $500 million in reparations to blacks in the U.S. Tutored is only the beginning of the amount owed. In the following month, Foreman audaciously interrupted Sunday service at Riverside Church in New York, okay, to announce the reparations demand from the Black Manifesto. And guess what? Several religious institutions did, in fact, respond with financial donations. Take note, Jesuits and others. In 1972, the National Black Political Convention in Gary, Indiana, adopted the anti-depression program. Now, what was that? It was an act authorizing the payment of a sum of money in reparations for enslavement and negotiating commission between representatives of the United States and the Republic of New Africa to determine kind, dates, and other details of paying reparations. The Nation of Islam's publications, Muhammad Speaks, and later the final call in the section, What We Want, What We Believe, has demanded that the United States exempt black people from all taxation as long as we are deprived of equal justice. And Minister Farrakhan's classic speech detailing the atrocities against black people in this country forever rings in my mind. He said, what are black lives worth? He demanded, add it up. Add it up. Add it up. The end of the 20th century brought renewed vigor to the call for reparations for people of African descent in the United States with the founding of the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America, in Cobra. I know there's a lot of Cobra folk in there. Just give a shout out if you're out there in Cobra in the house, okay? Which at its founding brought several groups, several entities together, the Republic of New Africa, the Black Reparations Commission, the National Conference of Black Lawyers, um, among others, with the goal of building a mass-based movement for reparations in the United States. And since the founding of NCOBA, the African American call for reparations has substantially moved forward, generating what I call the modern day reparations movement. And along the same time frame as uh, NCOBA opening up that uh, casket, we had the National African National Reparations Organization and the reparations initiatives of the National Black United Front and the December 1st movement and the Black Radical uh, Congress and today newer manifestations such as hashtag 40 uh, acres and more. And of course, the young folk, the movement for black lives. And today there is also NARC, the National African American Reparations Commission, which derived its inspiration and modeled after the CARICOM Reparations Commission, uh, which is mobilizing to, uh, as we heard before, demand um, compensation from the former European colonists. Uh, so like CARICOM and COBRA is opening up that casket with a strategic goal towards formulating a preliminary reparations program through the convening of regional hearings similar to Truth and Reconciliation, and the list goes on. But there have been pivotal moments during the modern day reparations movement which stand out and really help to open up that casket and push the claim forward. They include Randall Robinson's book, The Debt, What America Owes to Blacks, which was published in 2000. There was this horrendous advertisement published across college campuses by David Horowitz, 10 Reasons Why Reparations is a Bad Idea and Racist Too, that, that really served to uh, you know, stir, stir folk up. There was the United Nations Conference, World Conference Against Racism, held in Durban, South Africa, which declared, as we heard, heard earlier, the Atlantic slave trade as a crime 
against humanity that was major, as we heard. There was the research compiled by Deirdre of Farmer Palman revealing the corporate beneficiaries from the enslavement era. There was the Black Farmers lawsuit, the Tulsa, Oklahoma uh, litigation, the coming to light of the 272 enslaved uh, persons sold by the Jesuits to uh, keep Georgetown University from bankruptcy. There were the um, academics, the works by Carlton Waterhouse and Mary Frances Berry and uh, Ray, 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 Raymond Winbush, and the list goes on and on. But one of the most recent manifestations to opening up that casket was Tanakasi Coates' yes. article yes. in the Atlantic Magazine, The Case for Reparations, which basically fussed the issue on living room coffee tables, that magazine sitting there. When you go to the doctor and to the dentist's office, it's sitting right in there. To the mainstream media, when I have people in my own office, young white millennials, coming up with a copy of the article. Yeah, you know, we know that uh, there's been a sea change. So in 1987, legislation was passed in this country authorizing the payment of $20,000 to each Japanese American detention camp survivor. That was cash money, okay. Uh, a $1.5 million trust fund to be used to educate Americans about the suffering of the Japanese Americans. A formal apology from the United States government and a pardon for all of those convicted of resisting detention camp internment. We, we kind of slush over that last one, but y'all need to listen to that. A pardon for all those who resisted. How many of our black freedom fighters are still languishing in prison today as a result of the COINTELPRO from the 60s and 70s? A pardon. That was part of the Japanese American Redress Bill. Let me tell you this, people. It is a sad commentary that the United States government has not taken responsibility for its role in enslavement or post-slavery segregation. Millions of blacks. It has never attempted reparation to African Americans for the extortion of labor for many generations, deprivation of their freedom and human rights, and terrorism against them throughout the centuries. The U.S. Senate and the House of Representatives did pass symbolic resolutions uh, apologizing for slavery and segregation, but guess what? The 2009 bill passed by the Senate included a disclaimer that those seeking reparations or cash compensation could not use the apology to support a legal claim against the United States. So after the passage of the Japanese American Redress Bill, and COBRA worked very closely with Congressman John Conyers in helping to draft what became known as H.R. 40, the Commission to Study Reparation of Proposals for African Americans um, Act. Was it perfect? No. Mm -mm. No, it didn't provide not one red cent to anyone. It was just a study bill, just to study the issue. Congress would always say, we study everything. What's up in the air? What's below the water? Why can't we just study this? This has been an issue that's been studiously avoided for generations. OK, but it was strategic because it was the same strategy that was just recently at that time successful for the Japanese Americans. So year without year, without fail, he introduced H.R. 40. It is that bill that's provided the cover and a mechanism to have a public policy conversation about this issue in the Congress of the United States. The issue of reparations for African Americans was once in the not too distant past unthinkable by mainstream America as viable public policy. But since the introduction of the original reparation study bill, and COBRA has been very active in inspiring several state legislatures and scores of city councils across the country to pass reparations type legislation or HR 40 endorsement resolutions. And just to name a, a couple of them, examples of Louisiana House of Representatives, the California State Assembly, the city councils of Detroit, Cleveland, Dallas, Chicago, Philadelphia, Washington DC, Baltimore, and more. And again, largely as a result of mobilization initiated by INCOBA during the 90s, numerous civil and human rights organizations, religious groups, professional organizations, civic groups, sororities, fraternities, labor unions, 
have also endorsed the call for reparations. We're talking about the NAACP, the National Baptist Convention, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, Association of Black Psychologists, Psychiatrists, National Conference of Black Political Scientists, National Conference of Black Lawyers, National Bar Association, the International uh, Association of Black Firefighters, the Detroit Board of Education, AFL-CIO, millions, not millions, but please, well, that would be nice, hundreds. <laughs> Hundred. Well, we need to get to that uh, uh, millions. And we heard earlier about the slavery disclosure ordinances, um, including four states, including um, 11 cities, including um, uh, Philadelphia. And finally, uh, also survivors of the torture we heard about by Chicago police received an unprecedented reparations package. Really, for this country, that was unprecedented based on a reparations ordinance passed by the Chicago City Council in 2015. And then in Cobra, also under the leadership of Ajua Yatoro, masterminded a legal strategy that identifies specific categories of harm, of injury areas, peoplehood, uh, education, health, criminal punishment, wealth, power, and the issue goes on. So now as you see, the issue over the years has been continuous and it has been studied enough. So in January, with the beginning of this Congress, the National African American Reparations Commission, NARC, under uh, the leadership of Dr. Ron Daniels, and Cam Howard, the co-chair of uh, NCOBRA, um, helped to develop for John Conyers an expanded HR 40 bill, which is, goes beyond the study for a commission to actually develop reparations proposals, not just study, we've studied it ad infinitum. So I submit that in the context of black people in America, the quest for reparations essentially constitutes four elements. Number one, the formal acknowledgement of historical wrong and an official unfettered apology for the dehumanization and atrocities of the enslavement era and beyond. And again, I say unfettered because remember that Senate apology bill? Okay, we will apologize, but you can't use our apology uh, for your claim for reparations. The second element, the recognition that the injury has continued throughout the years and it still manifests today. Element number three, the commitment to redress by the federal government which sanctioned the enslavement and subsequent segregation and by corporate entities and private institutions and religious entities which enjoyed unjust enrichment from the era and for the actual compensation in whatever form or forms are agreed upon. So, Nikichi, why? You keep talking about the federal government. Why is that so critical? What, what, what's in all the harm done by the states? So, you see, I learned from Brother Imari Obadelli that we must remember the origins of the black nation in North America. We are the descendants of Africans kidnapped and transported to the United States with the explicit complicity of the United States government and every single arm of the United States lawmaking and law enforcing machinery, U.S. federal law, state law, high court decisions, lower court decisions, the dehumanization, the atrocities, the terrorism of our enslavement in the U.S. They were not isolated instances. If I might be so blatant, as was stated earlier, it was a matter of war. War conducted under the specific authority of the United States Constitution. The kidnapping was a wrongful act for which our ancestors and we are the, as their heirs are entitled to damages. The enslavement was a wrongful act for which our ancestors and we as the heirs are entitled to damages. The stealing of our labor was a wrongful act, as was the genocide we are still suffering. We are entitled to damages, to reparations, to reparatory justice. The compensations we speak of are owed to us. So all this was sanctioned by the Constitution. U.S. Constitutional Article 1, Clause 1, Section 9, expressly guaranteed and sanctioned the continued importation of kidnapped African prisoners of war to every state that might desire us until the year 1808. That article also upheld the further dehumanization of the African by relegating our status to that of three-fifths of a white man. And most egregious, it was war conducted against the African on this soil under the authority of yet another constitutional provision, Article 4, Section 2, Clause 3, also known as the Fugitive Slave Provision, which mandated that no enslaved person even if he or she had reached a free state, 
None of us were free. It was the duty, it was the obligation, it was the constitutional responsibility of every and any white man, woman, or child to track down the escaped African and deliver him or her up to the government. Oh yes, you know I'm not making this up. We need to open up that casket. The 13th Amendment passed in 1865 recognized the freedom of all enslaved Africans and made it illegal to continue slavery except for that ridiculous except as punishment for a crime cause. I hope everyone saw the 13th by Ava DuVernay. Y'all know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, Google it up, 13th by Ava, that 13th clause. So anyway, 13th Amendment made it legal, except for that thing. But no payment, however, was made for stolen labor, land, cultural rape, physical rape, <laughs> economic exploitation. In fact, the Dred Scott case, um, law students have been decided scarcely eight years prior in which a Supreme Court justice ruled what? That a black person in America had no rights, which a white person was bound to respect. And that neither Dred Scott nor any black person could be a citizen of the United States in the manner in which that word was used in the Constitution. You see, when they wrote we the people, they meant we the white people. Although the 13th Amendment set no restrictions on the freedom of formerly enslaved people, the 14th Amendment passed two and a half years later, robbed them of some of their hard-won freedom. Yeah, that's what I said. The 14th Amendment robbed us of that international right to self-determination. You see, the 14th Amendment imposed the obligations of United States citizenship upon the African in America without his or her informed consent and without the benefits of that citizenship, and without any meaningful discussion of political alternatives inherent in the international right to self-determination. Now, you might not have thought of it in these terms, you know, due to the white ethnocentric manner in which education in the United States is generally taught, but I must say the audacity. How are you gonna take a free person, okay, and tell him he's got to become a part of your family? i.e. a citizen of your country, especially since you had castrated his father, you know, raped his mother, sold the children to your relatives, didn't ask him if he wanted to join your family, didn't ask if he wanted to start his own family. You know, we're talking about 1868, y'all. If the African were free, no one, not even the ex-slaveholder, could define the African's future status for him and impose a status upon him. This was the newly freed persons, the Africans alone. It was the fruit of the right to self-determination. That is why it is pertinent to understand the reparations is not solely an economic concept. It is a political concept as well, and it is a cultural one. You see, the black American claim to reparations is not limited to stolen labor, but also for unjust war and cultural aggression as well. When I was first exposed to this issue, it was in the context that the political essence of slavery was not merely found in the economic exploitation of labor, but also in the illegal imposition of US jurisdiction on the enslaved and her descendants. It can never be overemphasized that black people are on this soil as a result of warfare, supported by the United States and other nations, and are here as the result of a vicious colonization, cultural rape, economic exploitation under chattel and mental bondage and terror and the full ramifications of this historical record must not be endlessly ignored. Open up that casket. This is why repertory justice is so important. Every time we ran away, it didn't matter if we just walked away, tiptoed quietly in the night, Harriet Tubman. It didn't matter if we organized elaborate slave insurrections, Demarvisi. It didn't matter if we fled to Pennsylvania or New York. They were going to come after us and with their armed forces and with their paddy rollers and with their militias and with their dogs. Why didn't it matter? Because the white folk had decided that they were going to live here. Wasn't going to be no 100 years of Palmari's liberation, no Ganga Zumbi here. They vowed that they would not just let us just walk into the woods and swamps and develop our own and they go back to France or England and Spain because it got too hot. This was not going to be their vacation spot. They had planned to stay. And so they chased us and they pursued us and they tracked us down, they beat us, they castrated us, they lynched us, and they sought to quell all forms of resistance. So my brothers and sisters, 
when we see the video of the ruthless pursuit chasing and blatant gunning down of Walter Scott in South Carolina like a runaway slave, when we see the gunning down of Michael Brown in Ferguson like a dog in the street, when we see Eric Garner in New York being choked to death and the countless others all by those who have been sworn to uphold the law, we know that there is a connection between the U.S. criminal punishment system and the necessity for reparatory justice. When we hear about the water crisis in Flint, Michigan and the impact of lead paint on black children in inner city communities, we know that there is a connection between the disparities in the healthcare system and the necessity for reparatory justice. When we see that black youth are selling drugs, we know that there is a connection between the lack of economic opportunity and the necessity for reparatory justice. When we see that prison beers are constructed based on the test scores of black boys in the third grade, we know that there is a connection between the educational system and the necessity for reparatory justice. There is a connection between post traumatic slavery syndrome and post-incarceration stress syndrome and the necessity for reparation justice. And when we see that little black girls prefer white dogs as pretty and smart over black dogs characterized as ugly and dumb, there is a need for reparatory justice. Open up that casket. The connections between the past and the present abound and in the midst of the current Me Too movement, a group of sisters uh, at a national African American Reparations Commission convening recently got together impromptu and issued the following statement, quote, as attention is called today to the ugly reality of present day sexual harassment, there must also be attention to the historical sexual violations of black women during the enslavement era and beyond. For well over 350 years, black women were viciously raped, savagely beaten, tortured, had fetuses cut out of their bellies, oftentimes by the perpetrator of sexual assault upon them. Women who resisted were terrorized, continuously defiled, disrespected, and lynchings were commonplace. Oftentimes, white women were complicit in condoning the sexual crimes of white men against black women, and oftentimes falsely accused black men of rape, leading to their murder and dismemberment. Just as we do not condone or take lightly present day disclosures and accusations of sexual harassment against even the architect of HR 40, the unfettered crimes against women of African descent during the enslavement era and beyond that to date still await remedy must never be forgotten. And we must begin the process of national healing by acknowledging the historic harm of enslavement sanctioned by the federal government, which led to colossal and commonplace sexual violations against enslaved women. There is a connection, and each harm must be compensated. And it is past time that the role of the federal government be opened up and acknowledged. But there's more. I submit that the slavery that flourished in the United States and its legacy constituted an immoral and inhumane deprivation of the Africans' life, liberty, and cultural heritage. And this word has been thrown around a whole lot today, okay? But I'm gonna break it down because it does, in fact, constitute an act of genocide. It's defined under the International Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, which was ratified by the Senate in 18, 1986 after 38 long years and signed into law by President Reagan as the Genocide Convention Implementation Act. Now I know some of y'all are saying, I know we've heard it all day, but we heard it in the context of the native peoples, we heard it in the context of the islands and all of that, it's okay. But when we talk about genocide in the context of black people in this country, so oh no, Nikita, you've gone a little bit too far. You can ruminate on reparations for genocide. Don't go there, girl. But I must, because we can no longer sweep it under the rug. We gotta do what? Open up that casket. What is the international accepted definition of genocide? I'm just gonna recite three of the elements. Number one, killing members of the group. Number two, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. Number three, deliberately inflicting upon the group conditions of life calculated to bring upon their destruction in whole and in, or in part. That 
is the basis of the international definition of genocide, which has been ratified by the United States and really is really the only international human rights treaty that is applicable in US law because of the Implementation Act. Um, if you want to find out a little bit more about it, Google up American Constitution Society, Taifa Genocide, because I did do an article dealing with the criminal justice system and outlined each of those um, uh, elements. But that's not all. Genocide is not the only actionable act. Also punishable is conspiracy to commit genocide, directing public incitement to commit genocide, attempt to commit genocide, and complicity in its commission. And I know Professor um, not to say to can tell you all of this, and she's the international law scholar, but it's there. Y'all connect the dots. Not surprisingly, one of the reasons for the 38 year delay in Senate ratification of the treaty was the concern that black people in America would use the treaty to their advantage. Oh yes, that concern was not without substance. In 1951, William Patterson, W.B. Du Bois, Mary Church Terrell, and 91 others submitted a petition to the United Nations for relief from a crime of the U.S. government against the Negro people charging what? The United States with genocide. The physical killings of black people so well established as to be a matter of what we call under the law judicial uh, notice, okay? Uh, the assaults, maiming, psychological terror, educational deprivations all fit within the category of imposing serious bodily or uh, mental harm, and the list kind of goes on. But perhaps more devastating than the loss of black life is the destruction wreaked by what Du Bois talked about, the tightening up of black codes. This is in Black Reconstruction in America. He said they could own nothing. They could make no contracts. They could not control their children. They could hold no property. They could not hire out. They could not legally marry. They could not appeal from their masters. They could be punished at will. They could not testify in court. They could be imprisoned by their owners. And the criminal offense of assault and battery could not be committed on the person of a slave. The slave owed to his master and family a respect without bounds and an absolute obedience and this authority could be transmitted to others. A slave could not sue his master, had no right of redemption, no right to education or religion. A promise made to a slave by his master had no force of validity. Children followed the condition of the mother. The slave had no access to the judiciary, could be condemned to death for striking a white person. The entire legal apparatus was used by those with the power to do so to establish a legal tradition that sought to strip blacks of all human dignity. Genocide, don't be scared by it. It's international law and it applies to us in this country as well. We are entitled to reparations. The compensations we speak of are owed to us. Let me be unquestionably clear. There is no statute of limitations on redressing human rights violations, thank you, Vereen. And debts are neither absolved nor diminished by the passage of time. In fact, over time, unpaid debts grow larger with interest. Okay, Nikichi, I'm innocent. I should not be held liable for things that happened over 100 years ago. That was my great-great-grandfather. In fact, I'm a liberal. <laughs> well. We all stand on the shoulders of those who came before us. Although the present generation of whites may be innocent of what their forefathers and their foremothers did, as a people, they are in a privileged position because of the actions of their predecessors. Each generation passes its debts as well as its assets on to the next generation. The heritage which whites enjoy in this country is what has been called white skin privilege. They benefit from a society, a state, and economic structure, which is governed by white supremacy. And although we may debate methods of operationalizing this data for measurement, there is no question that Caucasians in this country enjoy the fruits of 400 years of unjust enrichment as a result of the stolen labor of African people. You see, reparations is owed by the government because of the wrongs committed by the government, even though many people may not have agreed with the government. In fact, since American tax dollars will and have paid for reparations in the future as well as in the past, in some ways, all of us, even African Americans, bear the brunt of paying for reparations. Indeed, you might not have thought about this, but African American tax dollars paid 
for reparations for the Japanese Americans. But what about new immigrants to this country who have no blood or other connection? Should they also have to pay? Again, newcomers are entitled to all the rights, privileges, or at least until Trump came into the office, <laughs> benefits of American citizenship once they became citizens, in addition to the debts and responsibilities of the country. America does not say to its new citizens, because you have no ancestral connection to this country, you cannot vote, stew in court, or enter into contact tracks. Everyone pays a debt, regardless as to whether or not they had anything to do with creating it. Okay, Nikichi, but what about affirmative action? Doesn't that make everything right? Well, let me tell you, I remember watching the debate on the floor of the House of Representatives during the um, uh, argument over the Civil Rights Act of 1990, and uh, Congressional Black Caucus member at that time, Craig Washington from Texas, stood up on the floor and said, nobody is asking for reparations. We're just asking for the crumbs from the table. And despite the fact that it, 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 you know, it was crumbs when compared to the debt owed, um, President Bush vetoed the bill anyway, saying that affirmative action encouraged racial quotas. And as we're all aware, affirmative action programs have met with much resistance and continue to come under attack. Federal legislative language evolved from minorities to disadvantaged minorities to the broader term disadvantage. You see, the original intent of bringing governmental relief to damaged classes of persons has yielded to a process of determining who is disadvantaged on an individual case-by-case -case basis. In other words, the burden of proving a disadvantaged condition has become an individual responsibility with society refusing to acknowledge that whole groups have been damaged to the degree where each individual within the group is automatically disadvantaged. Although there are now a number of categories or classes that fall under the umbrella of quote unquote disadvantage and all deserve special treatment, all of the disadvantaged are not equally disadvantaged. At one extreme on the scale of damage for African Americans and Native peoples to this country, so great has the official and governmental damage to these groups been that they deserve as groups special treatment as a matter of reparatory justice for long-term widespread debilitating damage. The definition of their past injustices must begin with the founding of this nation. At the other end of the spectrum are physically or mentally disabled individuals who are disadvantaged, but not necessarily as a, a, a state of function of the government, but who are in a position to be victimized by the larger society if there's no official effort made to assist them. Other categories include Latinos, other ethnic nationalities, white women, political refugees, and the temporarily disadvantaged. Thus, in structuring federal policies and programs, to compensate the disadvantaged, recognition should and must be given to all disadvantaging conditions. However, it is also necessary to give substantial additional weight to the particularly injurious results of human chattel slavery and of government sanctioned exploitation and discrimination, especially when they continue for centuries. And that additional recognition must be in the form of reparations. And now the jackpot. Elephant in the room, we've addressed it earlier. Nikichi, is reparations just about the money? Sorry to burst your bubble, but no, reparations is not just about the money. In fact, it's not even mostly about the money. In fact, money may not even be 1% of what reparatory justice is all about. And it's mostly about making repairs, yes. mental repairs, psychological repairs, cultural repairs, organizational repairs. Technological, economic, political, education, the list goes on. Indeed, a reparation settlement can come in as many forms as necessary to equitably address the many forms of injury sustained from chattel slavery and its vestiges. Some of these forms of reparations can include funds for scholarships and community development, creation of multimedia depictions of the history of African Americans and textbooks of for educational institutions to tell history from the African descendants' perspective, development of historical monuments and museums, return of artifacts and art to appropriate people or institutions, the exoneration of political prisoners, pardon to all those who resisted uh, unjust laws and, and practices, and echoing the words of Professor Shen Yusu, author of The West and the Rest of Us, he said we must acknowledge 
that we are not the only people in the world who are seeking or who have sought reparations. I would just suffice it to say that with such precedents for reparations to non-black peoples spanning four continents, it would be sheer racism for the world to discountenance reparations claims from the black world. Some others, he said, may need only be that their ancestral home range be returned, others compensated for the indignities of internment, others that acts of genocide be atoned for, some others that land excites from their te territory be paid for. We, however, who have experienced all of the above and more and experienced them for longer than most and therefore suffer chronically from their efforts, we must take a more comprehensive view of what reparations mean for us. We must ask not only that reparations be made for specific acts, but we who have been such monumental victims are obliged to also ask what sorts of systems and policies and practices made this law ma'afa, that's our term, possible? And what must be done to transform these systems and policies such that injustices will never be so inflicted uh, today? As Dorothy Lewis tells us, the debt, the reparations debt, can be paid in as many ways as Africans can dream up and find acceptable to address the root ills of the com community. But let's not get it twisted. Money cash payments are not out of the picture. They remain a valid part of any repertory justice settlement. You might ask, well, shall Oprah or other wealthy people get a check? The answer is short, sweet, and simple, yes. If Oprah stepped out on the street and got hit by a car, I'm sure the outcome would not be, I'm Oprah, I'm rich, you don't owe me. It is just a basic principle of, of law and of justice. And then finally, it is critical that mobilization on this issue of repertory justice not be limited to the victims of the enslavement. My white colleague, Katrina Brown, uncovered evidence that her ancestors were the largest slave trading family in U.S. history. She documented her roots, that they brought over 10,000 Africans to the Americas in chains in her Sundance acclaimed film, Traces of the Trade, a story from the deep north. She's taking her story across the U.S., stressing that the slave trade was not just a few people taking a boat and sending it out. She said everybody in the town lived off of slavery. The boat maker, the iron worker who made the shackles, the coopers who made the barrels to hold the rum, the distillers who took the molasses and the sugar and made it into rum. Literally, she said the entire town was dependent on the slave trade. Wealth and privilege in the United States, she says, has been amassed in large measure as a direct or indirect consequence of the institution of slavery. And as I bring this lecture to a close, I want to make sure that I've made it plain that the role that governments, corporations, industries, religious institutions, academic institutions, private estates, and other entities played in supporting the institution of slavery and subsequent discrimination directed against African descendants held as slaves in Western Hemisphere must not be closed in the casket. Their roles must be opened up, must be recognized, discussed, and redressed. Such acknowledgments which repair is essential to the process of racial healing and toward the closing of a shameful era of history. And I'm gonna end with this, channeling the spirits of our modern day reparations, freedom fighters from this country, Queen Mother Moore, reparations, Ray Jenkins, Brother Mario Badali, Chokwe Lumumba, Baba Hannibal, Afrik, Dorothy Lewis, Njeri Agahani, Kalanji, Alushegun, all of who consistently demanded reparations and elevated the claim. And in the words of Frederick Douglass, they are actualized. His quote, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess the favor of freedom, yet deprecate agitation, are those who want the crops without plowing up the ground. They want the rain without the thunder and the lightning. They want the ocean without the awful war of its mighty waters. Frederick Douglass said back then in history, and it still rings strong today, said power, power, power. Does what? Concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. Open up that casket reparations now. <laughs>
we're just gonna do, um, that was amazing. <laughs> we're just gonna do a brief Q&A. So it might go a little bit, a little bit, a few minutes past four if that's fine. Uh, but we just have some questions that we wanted to ask. Uh, so one of the questions we received was, can you speak about the multi-generational consequences of the war against uh, people of African ancestry, especially the mental health consequences, reduced life expect expectancy, reduced creativity and productivity, and the effect this has on the oppressors as well? Well, it has definitely been multi-generational. Thank you for that, because many people think that it just ended in the enslavement era, but the reason why the claim is still strong because there is continuing injury down through today. No matter what system uh, you're talking about, I think the question raised the health system, the economic system, the criminal punishment uh, system, I don't think that there has been any area that really has not been touched by the trauma and the damage um, uh, that has come from the enslavement era. Even just the cultural, educational history, I knew nothing about, and I, I heard Brother Gonzalez um, earlier, and that's, I still can't even say the word of the name of your people. I mean, I'm just saying, that, that's damage. That's damage. That's my brother. I don't know his history. You, you know what I'm saying? So all of that is part of that trauma that trauma that has gone down through uh, generations, and it is a trauma that needs to be rectified today. Thank you for that. Um, so another question is, how does the claim against the federal government affect the claim against institutions? Oh, well, again, it's not an either or. <laughs> it's both and, okay? Oh. Uh, the, the, the role of institutions of the federal government, of state governments, of religious uh, institutions, of corporations, of private estates, because there's history in, in that too that can still be, uh, the debt is owed from each of those uh, entities. And that's why it is so important that we have some type of commission. Uh, right now it's the commission that um, uh, that's part of H.R. 40, to look at all of that history, look at the role of each of these culpable parties, okay, many times acting interlocutory with each other, conspiratorially, uh, so, and determine just what the remedy is going to be. And this determination is something that, again, was stated earlier, is not to come from the oppressing parties, but to come from the people who have been injured themselves. Uh, so we have two more questions. So the uh, third one is, in your view, what do reparations in America look like for those who are owed them? For those who are owed them. Owed them. Oh, oh what does reparations? Uh, well, again, that there's been a process of articulization of that ever since I've been involved with the reparations uh, movement. There are so many um, um, examples and representations as to just what reparations can look like. We heard one, which was a very novel one, um, earlier with the Chicago police uh, torture uh, case. I think the key thing is, is to recognize that, or even with the GU-272, if there is a, a, a payment of a debt owed in one particular area, that does not necessarily absolve it in other areas um, as well. This is a multifaceted issue and it calls for a multifaceted uh, solution. So the struggle continues on each and every front where the debt is due. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, this is the final question. Uh, so what are the next steps to get reparations from the U.S. for slavery? What are the next steps we can take? Okay, well, I say the next steps are a continuation of the steps that have already been going on uh, historically. And one of that is education about the... Um, uh, about the claim. This is not something I learned about in school. I'm glad to hear that as part of the Chicago uh, Police Torture Ordinance that part of that uh, uh, remedy is actually education in the schools of the damage and harm that was done by that police uh, uh, torture. Uh, education is really uh, key. Um, the, ARC, the National African American Reparations Commission is going around the country. Um, I'm um, holding uh, regional reparations convenings, listening and hearing from the people themselves, putting forth part of its 10-point program and seeking reflection from others as to just what that is. And COVA, National Coalition of Black Reparations in America, has a, a primer, HR 
40 primer seize the time. I think it can be found on in cobraonline.org. Um, uh, the National African American Reparations Commission, just a whole slew of information about reparations can be found on the Institute of the Black World 21st website, ibw21.org. So it's education, making sure that we know about what is happening, the precedence for reparations, that there is a, this is a legal and legitimate claim for black people uh, in this country, and also connecting with other reparation activists around um, the world. Many people don't realize we're going into the third year of the international decade for people of African descent. Okay, but again, some people want to sweep the issue of reparations under the rug. What better vehicle is there other than an international UN uh, acclaimed decade that specifically looks at issues dealing with African descendants? What better issue to look at other than reparations? So I think all of those are next steps. On that note, we're going to give her another round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to our amazing keynote speech.